Part 1 You will hear a woman asking a shop assistant about DVD players. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 1 to 4. Hello, I'm interested in buying a DVD player. Can you help me, as I don't know very much about them? Of course. We sell quite a range. Actually, we're doing a customer survey at the moment, so I wonder if I could fill in this form about you, and that will actually help me to advise you on the best DVD player for you. Oh, OK. <laughs> First of all, your occupation. Um, student. OK. Then, have you already got a DVD player? Uh, no, I've never had one before. Uh-huh. And how much do you think you want to spend on a player? Mm, I'm not sure, really. But I have got a budget. My friend said I should allow about £100. But I can't afford over £85, so that's what I'm working on. Mm-hmm. And... Do you watch DVDs very often? Um, depends what you mean by often. I don't know what the norm is. Is it about two a week? Uh, I suppose I watch three a month. That's enough for me. Yes. <laughs> what sort of films do you like watching then? Action movies? <laughs> Not really. Oh. My boyfriend always insists we watch science fiction movies, but... I prefer thrillers. Something to get your teeth into. OK. Just one more. Do you watch other DVDs? Ones that are not films, like music or something? Not much, because I don't want to spend the money on something I can watch on TV. But I occasionally rent out comedy programmes. And I fight with my boyfriend over all the sports DVDs he watches. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 5 to 10. OK, let me explain a bit to you about the DVD players that are in your price range. First, there's the DB30, which has only got basic features, but it is a bargain at £69. Now, all the DVDs come with an after-sales service that starts when the guarantee runs out. As it's so cheap, the DB30 comes with a limited after-sales service, as it only includes parts. You would have to pay for most of the repair. Oh, mm, seems OK. Mm. Then a slight grade up from that is the XL643. This comes with an additional feature in that it has an extra button allowing you to record. That's quite useful. Oh, yes. That would mean spending less on DVDs to watch. Yes. So you'd make the extra money back on it that it costs. Mm. Let me see how much it is. Uh, ah, yes. That one's actually reduced at the moment from £79 to £71.99. Oh. I think it's worth the extra myself. And is that the same level of after-sales service as the other one? Well, you get a bit more for your money because what we're offering is a discount on labour. So you don't pay the full price if you have to call an engineer out. I see. Then the last one is this Tri-X 24. It's a very good player, and you can use it to listen to your CDs as well as watch DVDs. Mm, it looks nice, but 
I bet it's expensive. No, it's not top of the range. Let's see. Yes, it's £94. But what you have to remember is that that includes insurance, so you don't have to pay extra for that. And it comes with a guarantee that's valid for three years, as opposed to the usual one. What do you think? Hmm, maybe. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a student union officer explaining about the union's functions and services to a group of new university students. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hello everyone. Now here you all are, new university students. And the first question you probably have is, what is a student union? Another question is, do I have to join? Well, regarding this second question, let me say that membership used to be compulsory in the past, but that did cause some controversy, particularly from students who wanted to remain free and unaffiliated, and this university responded, so joining up is no longer compulsory. It's totally up to you, although I'll admit there is a fairly strong obligation to join since all students benefit from the large variety of services that we offer. We do understand, however, that many might be unwilling to join because of a supposed political slant to the union. Traditionally, student unions have been seen as being dominated by the left and I suppose that's still true to a large extent. Here, however, at this university, our union discourages such one-sided viewpoints and students across the whole political spectrum are welcome. Thus, if you feel that you are a conservative type, in other words, leaning to the right, you are particularly urged to join to provide a more balanced representation. Now, let me move back to the first question. What are we? We are a formal organisation, but totally independent of the educational body. We make our own rules, rent our own premises and organise ourselves as we wish. And our mission is basically to help you. For example, do you remember how you all arrived in late February to have an orientation week? That gave you an invaluable induction into life here, right? Well. The student union organised all the festivities at the end of that. The barbecues, partying and drinking and even the musical entertainment as well. We'll do that again on occasions and, as always, those events take place on the football ground. Now, do you have any questions before I move on? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. 
Now, let me tell you more about the student union and its basic functions. In general, there are three social, organizational, and representational. Let's look at the first one. Basically, the union provides many social outlets for you to relax and have a better life at university. If you go to our union office, you'll find a list of the many clubs and societies we have, where you can make many friends with people who share a common interest. So, after class, sit with them in the cafeteria and discuss whatever takes your fancy. We also maintain sporting facilities and even our own gym, allowing you to relieve some of that pressure and worry after a particularly hard session in the classroom. And we have some small shops and other places where you can buy clothes and sporting gear, in other words, some retail outlets. And if you flash your student union card, you'll get up to 20% discount at the bookshop. But unfortunately, there are no discounts at the union cafeteria. Sorry, no cheap cappuccinos. Finally, there's a student union newspaper, and you're welcome to contribute or put in advertisements if you're buying and selling goods or textbooks. You can also place notices of a more personal nature on the notice board of the union office itself. All right. Let's move on to our more serious functions, which are helping you get through life here, as well as representing you in times of trouble. Regarding the second issue, if you have a problem or a grievance, or if you feel under pressure or depressed for reasons both inside and outside the university, for example, perhaps a dispute with your landlord or the people in your local gym, then come to us. We have a range of counsellors and helpers, and even some lawyers, who you can meet in the conference room. So just sip a cup of tea or coffee with them and tell them your troubles, and they'll be all ears. Basically, there's every reason to join the student union, since whatever you need, whether it be social or representational, we will help you. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a student, Penny, talking to two friends, Ray and Louise, about a television competition Ray has entered called Travel Documentary. Before you hear the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Hi, haven't seen you two in ages. What have you been up to? Hi, Penny. Ray is really excited. He's just been shortlisted for travel documentary. He could be off travelling around the world for three months. Travel documentary? What's that? You've never heard of it? Don't you watch TV? Well, actually, no, hardly ever. Especially since I've started working on my thesis, I don't have time to breathe, let alone watch TV. So, what's this all about, Ray? Well, actually, it it's a competition run by Public TV. It involves my two great loves: travel and filmmaking. Is it that program where people are sent around the world making documentary videos? I have heard of it. Fantastic! 
So you've been chosen? Not yet. I'm one of 34 selected for an interview next week, so I've made it through the first cut. Yeah, there were over 200 applicants from around the country. Pretty amazing, hey? Well, I've been lucky so far. What's the next stage? 13 are chosen from the interview to do a four-week training course in documentary filmmaking. Then, the eight finalists get sent off with a video camera to travel around the world. Sounds incredible! What's the catch? The catch is that every two weeks you have to send in a 10-minute video from a different part of the world. It's broadcast on TV along with the work of three of the other competitors and judged by a panel of experts and the TV audience. So you're under a lot of pressure. Wow, I guess so. You mean you're on television every two weeks? Yep, that's right. But first, I have to be selected. Do you have to have any filmmaking experience to apply? Some background in photography or video making helps. But you're not supposed to be an expert. In fact, you can't apply if you've already worked in filmmaking. We all get the same four-week course, so we start with the same skills. Can you go anywhere in the world you want? Each competitor makes up his or her own travel plans and has to get them approved. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now, as the conversation continues, answer questions 27 to 30. Have you talked with anyone else who has done it? As a matter of fact, just last week, I met Sarah Price, a girl from here who did it last year. What did she have to say about it? She said it was the most amazing experience of her life, but it was really tough at times. I think you'd have to be really brave to take off like that alone with so much responsibility. It's not like going on a holiday, is it? <laughs> no. Two weeks in a country often where you can't speak the language to find a story, film it, organise all the editing. Then you're off to a completely different part of the world to start all over again. Pretty exhausting, but exciting too. What a way to see the world. What about Sarah Price? Did she have any bad experiences? She said the worst part was when she got some mysterious fever in Mongolia and thought she might have to be sent home. Fortunately, it got better, but she said it was scary to feel really ill when you're alone so far away. So what made you want to apply? When I saw the program on TV a while ago, I thought, this is for me. I've always wanted to travel, but needed to work for a year before I could even think about it. Then a new series started up. I thought, now's my chance. Don't you think you'll be lonely? I don't think I'll have time to be homesick. I'm more worried about having too much to do and not enough time to get things organised. So we might be watching you on television in the next few months? I hope so, if I'm lucky. When will you know for sure? They choose the final eight in March. A month later, you're on your way. So do you have to pay anything? Nothing. It's all paid for. Course, camera, flights, accommodation and in-country travel. The budget is pretty tight, though. No extras. I sure hope you get it. Then I'll be finding time to watch at least one program on television every week. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a talk on two famous American presidents. As you listen, fill the missing information in the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. John F. Kennedy and Abraham Lincoln lived in different times and had very different family and educational backgrounds. Kennedy lived in the 20th century, while Lincoln lived in the 19th century. Kennedy was born in 1917, whereas Lincoln was born more than 100 years earlier in 1809. As for their family backgrounds, Kennedy came from a rich family, but Lincoln's family was not wealthy. Because Kennedy came from a wealthy family, he was able to attend expensive private schools. He graduated from Harvard University. Lincoln, on the other hand, had only one year of formal schooling. In spite of his lack of normal schooling, he became a well-known lawyer. He taught himself law by reading law books. Lincoln was, in other words, a self-educated man. In spite of these differences in Kennedy and Lincoln's backgrounds, some interesting similarities between the two men are evident. In fact, many books have been written about the strange coincidences in the lives of these two men. For example, take their political careers. Lincoln began his political career as a U.S. congressman. Similarly, Kennedy also began his political career as a congressman. Lincoln was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1847. Kennedy was elected to the House in 1947. They went to the Congress just 100 years apart. Another interesting coincidence is that each man was elected President of the United States in a year ending with the number 6-0. Lincoln was elected President in 1860 and Kennedy was elected in 1960. Furthermore, both men were President during years of civil unrest in the country. Lincoln was President during the American Civil War. During Kennedy's term of office, Civil unrest took the form of civil rights demonstrations. Another striking similarity between the two men was that, as you probably know, neither lived to complete his term in office. Lincoln and Kennedy were both assassinated while in office. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas, after only 1,000 days in office. Lincoln was assassinated in 1865 a few days after the end of the American Civil War. It's rather curious to note that both presidents were shot while they were sitting next to their wives. These are only a few examples of the uncanny and unusual similarities between the destinies of these two American men, who had a tremendous impact on the social and political life of the United States and the imagination of the American people. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.